Good afternoon. It's Monday the 23rd of April 2018, just after one o'clock. Welcome to UK Column News. I'm your host, Mike Robinson. Joining me in the studio today, Patrick Henningsen from 21st Century War. Welcome to the programme, Patrick. Great to be with you, Mike. Uh, right, we're going to get straight on then with, uh, with Yemen. Now, we haven't talked about Yemen in quite some time. A lot of the focus, Patrick, has been on Syria. Uh, but uh, this is an image uh, showing uh, another Yemeni wedding bombed by uh, uh, Saudi Arabia, UAE. Now, I'm going to show just uh, a little bit of uh, video. It's quite disturbing, but uh, a, number, a number of points here. First of all, this is uh, uh, a young boy being uh, rescued from the rubble uh, by the first responders, which are not wearing white helmets. Uh, the father, unfortunately, is dead, uh, and the boy was absolutely refusing to uh, leave his father's side. Um, it staggered me, Patrick, uh, how... The approach of the people attempting to help here is so much different to that that we see in Syria. Mm. Uh, but, you know, the key point is here that uh, yet again we have an ongoing conflict which gets virtually no media coverage uh, and certainly none of the criticism that uh, people are receiving uh, in the Syrian conflict. The first thing is for people to realize you're looking at a real uh, aftermath of a real bombing here. And like Mike, Mike just said, just contrast that with the sort of staged, uh, contrived uh, videos from the White Helmets, which they've been pumping out uh, for the last five years out of Syria. Uh, but it is, it is amazing, Mike, that uh, uh, a tragedy like that doesn't warrant any international outrage, uh, doesn't order uh, uh, any righteous indignation on the part of any of the Western politicians or the Guardian or any of the media outlets. Um, so where... Where is the concern? Does it does it mean that the Yemeni lives are not worth as much as the as the as the lives that uh, are tied to some uh, U.S. or British intervention? Uh, well, of course, there's no need uh, in the case of Yemen. There's no need for the mainstream media in this country to be promoting war because it's already happening, and it's already happening with the full support of the British government uh, with arms sales and so on. Uh, but uh, now we missed this at the time. This is about a week old, actually. This Guardian article. Uh, it's from uh, it's from Dr. Lena Khatib, uh, who is uh, head of Middle East and North Africa program at the Royal Institute for International Affairs, otherwise known as Chatham House. Uh, and uh, the headline in the Guardian it was uh, it was right to strike Syria, but only bringing Russia to the table can end the Syrian conflict. Well, uh, it wasn't right to strike Syria. Uh, but I think we could agree that only bringing Russia to the table can end the Syrian conflict. But of course, Russia is already at the table. It's us that don't want to take part in, in the peace process that's going on. Isn't that that, that is the case? Is a fair statement? Uh, yeah, well, you're, you're trying to illustrate uh, uh, the situation, Mike. But what the problem here is, what is, my question is, what is the agenda behind this is Chatham House speaking, right, ostensibly? So what is the Chatham House agenda here? Well, what they're saying is, I'll just quote a little bit, it should not be forgotten that in the end, chemical weapons are not the main problem in Syria. They are the symptom of the real problem, which is the Assad regime in power. So the first point is that the Chatham House continues the get rid of Assad rhetoric. There can never be peace in Syria while the regime of Bashar al-Assad is in power, they say. She says, uh, now that the US is committed to military action, uh, attacks can only be a means to an end, the route to putting enough pressure on Russia to convince it to agree to serious negotiations. Serious negotiations mean declaring the Astana process and the Sochi talks dead and abandoning the facade that Russia became adept at exhibiting Excuse me. Uh, during the Geneva process. Uh, for Russia to behave seriously in negotiations, it has to believe that the US is serious. Uh, what works in favour of the US is that its key allies, the UK, France and Saudi Arabia, are all aligned. Uh, this gives it a unique opportunity to engage in a sustained, targeted campaign against Assad's military assets uh, that has wide international endorsement. So in other words, we've got to keep bombing because that's worked uh, to the degree that it's worked so far. Uh, the only way to get Russia to the table uh, is uh, to keep bombing, uh, because that shows that the US, Britain, France and Saudi Arabia are serious. Uh, and therefore, Russia will come to the table and get all this sorted out uh, very, very quickly. There's a few comments I'm just going to make to respond to this, Mike. The first is uh, the, uh, the author, Lena Khatib, is, is basically, as you said, Mike, parroting the assumption that uh, the Assad regime used chemical weapons on April 6th in Duma. Uh, there is no proof of this. There is no evidence. 
other than uh, edited social media postings. Uh, that, my friends, is not evidence. Uh, secondly, this uh, talking point, Assad must go. How long have they been ringing this rag out, Mike? Since 2011. It's almost as embarrassing as Russiagate, isn't it? <laughs> it's, it's, it's even longer than Russiagate, so yeah. who knows, Russiagate might outlast Assad must go. But, um, so, and again, advocating uh, military intervention as some sort of policy uh, in order to bring uh, the Russians to the negotiating table or force a political solution uh, in Syria. I would contend that this author has not been to Syria uh, recently, if if she if had, yeah. if she she would realize that uh, President Assad uh, is overwhelmingly popular. The Syrian government is overwhelmingly popular uh, in Syria. Well, I'm not talking about uh, fifty percent popular. I'm talking about sixty, seventy plus percent. People are behind the government. They're behind their president even more so because of the foreign backing to the so-called opposition. Uh, and my last point, Mike is she's saying that they must declare the Astana process dead. Um, I'll beg to differ, and I think anybody who's actually mm -hmm. paid attention would declare the Geneva process dead. From the minute it started with Geneva 1, then to 2, then to 3, the Syrian National Council, a hand-picked group of Westerners, there is somehow this kind of government in exile that they were somehow going to assume power in Syria. It was a joke. The only people who believed it, I think, are people who read The Guardian, and who watched the BBC. Um, Astana has actually done some amazing things on the ground. The de-escalation process, the peace and reconciliation process, uh, thousands of areas uh, have been converted from hot zones to de-escalation to now uh, completely, there's no combat, no fighting going on, and many militants have gone through the reconciliation process, which is guaranteed uh, by Russia. Um, and some have been relocated to the Idlib province, for instance, to sort of outsource the problem, get it out of the way, so that life can get back to normal in Syria. That's the reality of the Astana process. Uh, and unfortunately, the United States is not a, a stakeholder in that process. Mm -hmm. The effective process that's actually done real work on the ground, the U.S., Britain are not involved. So uh, again, what I'll say, Mike, is the center of gravity geopolitically has shifted from, from west to, to, to east, from ostensibly from Geneva, Switzerland, to uh, Astana, Kazakhstan, or if you will, from the U.S. Uh, to Russia and Iran. Turkey is also uh, part, uh, a partner in the Astana process as well. So once again, I, I can't believe, Mike, how Chatham House could get it this wrong, um, but it looks like they have. Um, well, you're talking about things shifting towards the east, and indeed they are. So let's look at a couple of examples. Uh, Russia-China summit going on today. Uh, this is uh, uh, Russia and China's uh, aiming to, to uh, have strict compliance with uh, international agreements. They're saying a uh, very important role in boosting global st uh, stability. So this is Sergei Lavrov uh, meeting with his uh, Chinese counterpart uh, Wang Li today. Uh, Russia and China's consolidated policy aimed at strictly complying with international law plays a key role in strengthening stability and security in the world, said Lavrov. We expect high intensity of contacts to be maintained this year as well. Uh, and uh, he said that for his part, uh, Wang Yi, this was said that for his part, uh, further strengthening of Russia-Chinese relations uh, is in the two countries' best interests. I hope that today's talk talks, which precede tomorrow's uh, SCO Council of Foreign Ministers meeting uh, will make it possible for us to talk about all issues and outline plans for the future. So uh, Russia and China getting ever closer uh, and we're starting to see uh, the chessboard, uh, the pieces moving into possibly their final positions, Patrick? Indeed, and also I think uh, there was an announcement this morning which we, we haven't reported uh, on the news line today, but Iran uh, announcing it will be moving off the US dollar uh, in terms of international trade. Uh, so th not that that wasn't expected, but still, nonetheless, um, that's just one more country uh, going off the U.S. dollar, the sort of the international fiat um, uh, standard of the U.S. dollar. So if this is a trend, uh, we'll see. But uh, I think it is in terms of uh, Russia and China trade as well. Now, uh, very important uh, because uh, in Southeast Asia, of course, we've got uh, Korea and uh, the peace process in Korea seems to be moving on a pace. Uh, and this is uh, uh, 
uh, Moon and Kim to uh, meet an official dinner on Friday. Apparently, this uh, uh, summit is going to take place. Uh, so uh, Moon Jae-in and uh, the leader of, uh, the, of North Korea, Kim Jong-un, uh, holding an official dinner uh, on joint security uh, during their historic summit. Uh, that's going to start on Friday. But uh, Patrick, Trump is somehow going to be involved in this uh, at some later date in the, in the next few weeks. Uh, but not as possibly not going quite as smoothly as he would hope. Well, the the, the meeting with uh, Donald Trump and um, North Korea and South Korean representatives at Roundtable Summit, uh, end of May, beginning of June, uh, and so there's, it's it's it is very hyped, Mike, and for for good reason because I think as we discussed yesterday on the Sunday Wire uh, program, uh, Donald Trump, this this could be his legacy moment. This could be the one achievement that could be inked in the history books uh, of something positive that uh, Donald Trump and definitive and tangible that Donald Trump has done uh, during his possibly his one term uh, even or even his two terms as president. We'll see what happens mm -hmm. in the next election. But um, so there's a lot of pressure um, by Trump, I think, to, to make this work. But at the same time, Mike, the Hawks are circling Donald Trump. The Vipers are well and truly in the nest in the, f in the form of John Bolton and others, and uh, I think what they want out of this Korean summit, Mike, is probably very different, and they're not concerned with Trump's legacy. What they're concerned about is basically getting leverage on China. And so if the United States brokers a peace deal or, or a treaty between, the US, uh, between North and South Korea, this could mean, Mike, the end of the DMZ, the demilitarized zone there, and with that, a uh, 70-year presence in Asia, mm -hmm. and really, the uh, if you look at the U.S. military presence in Okinawa, and even uh, it's trying to get more uh, 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 advantage in the Philippines as well, and uh, some of the other areas, this is all based really, they, they justify it on the basis of North Korea. So that, uh, although it's really about China, but the U.S. doesn't want to come out and say that um, it's geopolitically trying to encircle China, when in fact that looks like what they've been doing uh, for the last uh, two decades. Mm. But, um, so that's why this Korean summit is really important. How is it going to play out? Which direction is it going to go? Is it going to stall and turn into another Oslo situation that could string out over 10 plus years? And really, during that time, the U.S. will just be regrouping and, uh, and increasing its military presence and putting more geopolitical uh, silent pressure on China. These are the things to look for going into the summit uh, at the end of May or beginning of June. Okay, so uh, but just before we move away from international affairs, uh, uh, the G7 is taking place uh, in North America at the moment. Uh, Boris Johnson, as you can see, is, is over there. Uh, and uh, uh, they're talking about uh, the malign activities of Vladimir Putin. They're talking about uh, how terrible it is uh, with uh, nerve agents flying around the world and, and in Syria and in the UK. Uh, there's unity, they say, on opposing Russia's malign behaviour. Uh, and, uh, well, Macron was there, of course. We were talking about Macron on the uh, Sunday Wire last night as well. Mm. Uh, he says that the biggest priority for the G7 should be the spreading of fake news. They've got to deal with that. Uh, he said, uh, uh, don't be naive. Uh, Putin is obsessed by interference in our democracies. That's why I do believe that we should never be weak with President Putin. When you're weak, he uses it. So that's uh, that's what Macron was saying. But uh, there's uh, there's the happy, well, a happy couple there, uh, Ms. Mogherini and Boris Johnson. Uh, well, Boris Johnson also met up with uh, Acting Secretary of State, uh, John Sullivan. Uh, and I just thought he, uh, J Boris tweeted this picture out earlier on. Mm. Patrick, Not I just... Not very flattering, is it? I, I thought it was hilarious. I mean... Uh, <laughs> John Sullivan, uh, I've captioned this, who let this buffoon into the room. I'll leave it to the audience to decide which one of them is the bigger buffoon. But, but clearly John Sullivan is looking a bit uh, uh, distressed, depressed. Why would Boris tweet that picture out unless he's just trying to get as many selfies and pictures in before he himself uh, is out on the, uh, the carpet? We'll see. We shall see. Right, let's come back to the UK then. Now, uh, the Sunday Times pushed this out yesterday. Police and MI5 to get greater powers to fight terror. Uh, and they say that uh, they've seen some documentation which says that uh, there's going to be a focus on communities where the threat from terrorism and radicalization is highest. 
uh, Police Services and Domestic uh, Intelligence Agencies, that's MI5, GCHQ, will be focusing on individuals who are vulnerable to radicalization or who are or have been of interest to the police and the security and intelligence agencies due to their possible links to terrorist activities, but who are not currently the subject of any active investigations. So we're going to expand this, uh, this spy network uh, quite uh, significantly. Uh, they're going to alert a greater number of agencies to individuals of potential concern, uh, and they are going to uh, uh, call for a change of approach and so on. So, Patrick, uh, who do you think they're going to be targeting in particular? Well, it's the term extremist, uh, Mike. It, it can be a fungible term. Uh, it's elastic. So I think uh, that how wide is the, is the birth on that term extremism? Can that be extended to... Uh, dissenting opinions or challenging the government. Uh, that's based on some of the past statements by governments. David Cameron's uh, UN speech comes to mind, Mike. Uh, I think my fears there are not uh, that outlandish. Uh, no, and in fact, the document uh, says that, uh, of course, Islamic State is of concern. It still represents the most significant threat, it says, uh, that there's a persistent threat from Al-Qaeda, but it also says that there's a serious threat of Northern Irish terrorist factions and a growing threat from uh, right-wing extremists. Right, which right, the media right now is extending right-wing extremism into uh, anything from conspiracy theory uh, to anybody who's uh, seeming to be sympathetic to the Assad government, Assadists or Assad apologists or the Putinist or uh, people sympathetic to the Russian position will be extended into that right-wing uh, category that's already happened. My question, Mike, is um, are the police and MI5 going to, to look into any uh, members of the government or members of the security services who are involved in the arming, uh, the financing, the handling of radical jihadists from Britain going into Syria and coming back or to Libya in the past, as in the Manchester bombing? Um, is that on the table in terms of these investigations? Is that not a problem? We're talking about the top extremists. We're talking about the ones willing to go and uh, pick up a weapon and go and fight and kill people in cold blood uh, in places like Syria, in places like Libya. That, to me, Mike, uh, would be of a high priority. Yeah, I coming think. back here fully trained. I believe so, and I, I believe that should be uh, where all the, the state should be putting all its resources is finding out who these people are. In fact, shut it, maybe, maybe even looking in the mirror and shutting down any of these clandestine programs that have been operating uh, in, in, over the last decade. Mm. Um, right, now Novichok, uh, Patrick, uh, True Public has pushed this out today. The headline is Evidence, Novichok Delivery System Patented, patented in the US. Now we'll come on to Tim Hayward, of course, because uh, he, he mentioned this uh, in one of his articles uh, a couple of weeks ago. Uh, but this uh, adds a little bit to it. Um, so what they're saying is that uh, uh, as uh, desperately, sorry, deliberately overlooked or more likely ignored in the press was that Russia had submitted evidence uh, that the Novichok nerve agent was produced and patented in the United States as a chemical weapon in 2015. Uh, Russia's permanent representative to the Organization for Pro Prohibition of Chemical Weapons had said two weeks ago. Uh, True Publica say that they were not satisfied with Russia's story on the basis that they would, of course, defend themselves regardless of the truth. Mm -hmm. So unlike everyone else, well, mostly everyone else, because Tim Hayward and his group had already looked, but they looked. Uh, and they said half an hour later, they found over 80 patents of the 140 that Russia said were applied for. Uh, the ones we found revealed uh, the word Novichok in 81 patents as part of the patent document filing in the United States. Uh, they say that this does not mean that all patents actually involved the nerve agent itself. Uh, but it does suggest that this deadly substance was at least available, particularly as none of these patents go back further than 2002. And some of them were applied for as recently as 2016. Uh, and one they found uh, was granted as late as last November. Uh, and uh, just to give one example, they have a patent filing uh, that they give an example of, which is a powder dispersal device. Uh, and it was filed in May 2016. Uh, it includes, for example, without limitation, it says... Uh, Agent 15, which is BZ, ammonia, arsenic pentafluoride, boron tribromide, uh, boron trichloride, hydrogen cyanide, nitrogen mustard, the three variants, and a Novichok agent. So these patents aren't, are using the word Novichok. 
Uh, and then they say in True Publica, contrary to what we've been told about the deadly nature of Novichok's, there is a nerve agent antidote patent filed in 2013 that was granted in 20, November 2017. Another is for methods of detection and another for protection against uh, the neurotoxin toxin Novichok. Um, so uh, a whole host of... Uh, of patents. Now, of course, patents are patents. They don't mean that anything was actually developed following the patent filing. Um, Not but necessarily, but possi exactly, possibly, possibly. Absolutely possibly. Mm -hmm. uh, but uh, what it does do is demonstrate that the term Novichok and the type of nerve agent that we're talking about was front and center in people's minds because otherwise these patents wouldn't have been filed. Uh, and uh, we're looking at uh, delivery systems being developed. Uh, does this not hint at active weapon system development in the United States? Uh, it seems to be there's a plethora of evidence here, Mike, that's uh, pointing at the United States uh, as the real source of the Novichok industry. Uh, and you are right, uh, not just conveniently ignored, but, but uh, I think intentionally ignored in this case. Yes. Uh, so as we say, uh, Tim Hayward published this uh, a couple of weeks ago, update the briefing note, uh, doubts about Novichoks. So this is uh, something that's up on Tim Hayward's blog, which everybody can go and reference, but this is based on the work of the uh, Syri uh, Working Group on Syria Media and Propaganda, uh, of which uh, Piers Robinson, Professor Piers Robinson, is, is a member there and who's been on this show uh, just uh, recently. And so what it's, what it's saying here is that this, this idea of the, what, what the Novichok is, is the sort of the class of, of, of nerve agents, the, uh, the A23 to A260 range. Uh, and so it's saying that this has actually been developed by the United States even at the U.S. Army's Biological and Chemical Weapons uh, Research Center at Edgewood, Edgewood, Maryland, the Aberdeen Proving Ground at Edgewood, mm -hmm. Edgewood Maryland. So and this was uh, uh, recorded in 1998. And it was also listed uh, by NIST uh, on the database of compounds, but then suddenly Mike deleted um, off of the NIST list. We do we do have a screen. We had a screenshot of that, but you can go to Tim's blog and look at that. But uh, so this is a real uh, U.S. lab, a real U.S. military weapons lab, who's developed this high-grade nerve agent. Absolutely developed it. Mm. Uh, and so then we have a number of patents, Mike. It seems to me like that's where if you want to investigate of who's working on Novichoks, I think the United States is the place to go. Mm. Right, let's move on to the media, Patrick. Uh, and, well, I have to say, you nearly fell off your chair this morning uh, when you saw this. Well, you know, you can't make it up really, can you? This is a Pulitzer Prize 2018, and here we go. Uh, who won? The New York Times and the Washington Post, get ready for it, folks, have won a Pulitzer Prize for their relentless reporting and coverage uh, about Russian interference in the 2016 presidential elections. Sorry, can I just understand what's going on here? Two newspapers have won the Pulitzer Prize on the basis of coverage of something which didn't happen? Which didn't happen, which they haven't found any evidence of yet, uh, and the connections with the Trump campaign. So even on top of that, Russian collusion. So this, the, if anything, this should signify that the, the Pulitzer Prize is, like the Nobel Peace Prize, is well and truly a farce. Uh, but for, for journalism, Mike, the Pulitzer is meant to be the sort of the gold standard mm. in terms of journalism. And for them to give that award to those two papers that have been relentlessly pumping out fake news for the last 18 months on Russian interference and Russian Trump-Russian collusion and they get it, they both got a Pulitzer for it. So, so what's the moral of the story there, Mike? What message are they sending to, to aspiring journalists? Fake news is good. Fake news is good for your career. If you want to advance in the mainstream world, you got to be doing fake news. So, um, Thursday. Well, of course, uh, particularly for the BBC, if you want to be pushing out fake news, you got to be vetted first. Uh, and this came out yesterday. I think the vetting files how the BBC kept out quotes subversives. Uh, yes, this article seems to claim that this stopped in the mid-1990s. Do you believe that? <laughs> so it's, it, it's is extraordinary. So according to Paul Reynolds, one of the first journalists to have a look at this file, Mike, um, it, the, the broadcaster, the BBC, adopted a policy of keep your head down and stonewall all questions. Uh, so for how many decades? Five, six decades here. Uh, and so he, the quote here, this is from... Uh, 
the uh, Director General, uh, Sir Hugh Green, at the time. So we have 23,000 staff uh, in that community. We have people of all descriptions, including what you call pan pansies. Uh, the word had apparently been used by the reporter and also communists, said Green. Uh, so, and there was a fear, Reynolds wrote, that uh, evilly disposed engineers might sabotage the network at a critical time. This was in the run-up, I guess, or World War II. Um, or that conspirators might discredit the BBC so that uh, the way could be made clear for a left-wing government at the time. So my question is, based on that quote, Mike, has anything changed even politically, are we seeing the exact same thing? Is history not repeating itself in this instance? Well, and, and if you did have that policy of vetting BBC employees to make sure they're of the right political mind and, and also controlling speech uh, with MI5 doing the job of that, um, once you have achieved that power, Mike, why would you relinquish it yeah. uh, at any point? Yeah. Do you think there... Maybe both institutions had an epiphany in the 90s and saying, well, this isn't right. We shouldn't do this anymore. It's just not right. So let's just quietly stop the practice. Yes. Or like the CIA uh, from the Church Commission in the mid-70s, we learned about uh, the CIA's activities in all the major media outlets uh, and editorial desks in the U.S. mainstream media. And we're meant to believe that all of that stopped and uh, ceased to take place after the Church Commission hearings. Yeah, because I mean, you put, you put um, millions, if not billions, of dollars into of investment into setting up this infrastructure, and then you just you just throw it away, don't you? It's the sort of thing you do. Yeah, you're building up a network to basically control press, to control public perception on a whole range of issues. Mm -hmm. Why would you just withdraw? So I, I don't believe they did, not in 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 the U.S. and I don't believe in Britain or any other country that has a similar system. It's just not. Okay, well, let's, uh, let's look at this, uh, this example of fake news. And here's the Telegraph. Uh, and the headline is, uh, UN security team shot at uh, in Syria ahead of chemical weapons inspection. Now, of course, that headline itself is not incorrect. They, there, were gun, there was gunfire whenever the uh, uh, UN security team attempted to uh, uh, go to Douma ahead of the OPCW visit. And that was one of the reasons why the OPCW visit was delayed. It was nothing to do with uh, Russia holding them back and not letting them to Duma. It was because of a security risk. Um, but what I'm interested here actually is the photograph uh, of the young lad and, uh, and the caption. Uh, because here's the caption. It says, uh, Khaled Mahmoud uh, Nuzair, 25, who lost his wife and daughters during the alleged chemical weapons attack. Who lost his wife and daughters during the alleged chemical weapons attack. That was quite an unfortunate caption. They haven't changed it since, uh, since the video clip came out. Uh, but let's just have a look at the interview that he gave to RT quickly. People poured water over our heads, repeating that we had been attacked with chemical weapons. Somebody ran up from outside shouting about a chemical attack. Don't know who that was. So Patrick, do you think that looks and sounds like somebody who's just lost his wife and daughter? Uh, no, and no, it no, doesn't at all. No, and uh, and in fact, he they couldn't possibly have lost them unless they they got mislaid somewhere because there was no chemical weapons attack according to him. So what's the Telegraph doing here, Patrick? I don't know. What is the Telegraph doing? Well, I think it can only be doing one thing, and that is being purveyors of fake news. There can be no other explanation for this. It looks like a direct lie to me. Alert, alert, fake news. Please report to Theresa May's crack task force on fake news. The Telegraph is guilty of fake news. Um, so I'd like to say thank you to the person who sent that to, to me earlier on. I'd also like to say thank you to the person who sent this to me, because uh, this is the, the official emergency procedure. If you see any friend or colleague beginning to swallow mainstream media BS, uh, and it's uh, basically the Heimlich maneuver, and as you can see, uh, they throw up the, uh, the logos of the various mainstream media there. Uh, this, is the, this is the point that we're at, where people are increasingly just taking the uh, pee out of, uh, out of the mainstream press. I want to say thank you to uh, any UK column or also 21st Century Wire readers, listeners, and viewers for sending in or giving us tips on mainstream fake news, where there's actually false reporting or fabricated claims in the mainstream. We thank you very much. Uh, who knows, one day, Mike, um, I don't know, they could have a hot tip line 
for mainstream fake news, maybe even pay for tips. Well, uh, and, and maybe those tips will appear on Media on Trial at some future event, but mm -hmm. the next event is in Leeds uh, on the 27th of May. Uh, the details at mediaontrial.uk. Get along to that if you possibly can. It really is more necessary than ever. Now, uh, what's next? Get rid of it in the Express. Get rid of it. Massive 96% of Express readers want House of Lords abolished. Now I saw this being pushed around by uh, uh, a, an alternative media uh, source today, mm -hmm. uh, Patrick. And I have to say it made me a little bit cross that they were because uh, uh, they're missing the point completely. Uh, so what's this all about? Well, basically there was a defeat uh, of, of uh, part of the Brexit legislation last week in the House of Lords. Uh, and uh, of course the the fool of the day, Nigel Farage, was the first to be getting on a soapbox to say we've got to throw away the House of Lords uh, as a result. Now, there's lots of criticism about the House of Lords because it's an unelected body. Uh, but the point is that we have ended up uh, in a situation where uh, part of our uh, parliament, part of our parliament uh, has been uh, sort of half changed uh, it's been changed to the point where it's basically dysfunctional at the, at the moment. But this was a deliberate uh, act to change it in that way. And wh why was it a deliberate act to change it in that way? Because the House of Lords, the role of the House of Lords is to hold the House of Commons to account constitutionally and make sure that the, that, that, uh, uh, the government of the day doesn't run riot with the uh, constitutional uh, settlement that, that we have. Uh, so, who has been driving this modern process of, uh, of House of Lords reform? Well, it really began uh, with this man, uh, Tony Blair. Uh, and are we really saying now that we want to uh, promote the idea uh, of his political agenda? We want to promote that? I don't think we really do. But in 1997, after the general election, Tony Blair and the Labour government announced a bill to remove uh, the automatic right of hereditary peers to sit and vote in the House of Lords as the first stage of a process of reform. In 1999, the House of Lords Act received royal assent and they threw out uh, 600 hereditary peers. They left 92 uh, there until further reform. Uh, then uh, Tony Blair in 2003 published a consultation on the removal of the law lords uh, to be replaced by an EU-style Supreme Court. And in 2007, the government published its white paper, the House of Lords Reform, setting out uh, policy for a hybrid House of Lords with 50% elected members, 50% appointed members. Uh, and in March of that year, the House of Commons voted uh, on the options for uh, composition supporting an elected House of Lords. So this is something that uh, the Labour government under Tony Blair was pushing for extremely hard. The agenda was continued under the uh, Chuckle Brothers there, uh, and that's uh, David Cameron, uh, Nick Clegg uh, in the coalition government in 2012, the Joint Committee uh, on the Draft House of Lords Reform Bill published a report uh, recommending an electoral mandate and that 80%, that should say 80% of members uh, should be elected and 20% nominated. And in September that year, uh, Nick Clegg made a, sta uh, a statement with uh, announcing the withdrawal of the House of Lords Reform Bill and basically because they couldn't get the support that they needed for it. Uh, now this uh, process has continued under Theresa May and she also has not managed to get support of it to date, for it to date. Uh, but nonetheless, the Brexit issue once again seems to be being used to drive this mm. situation forward. Uh, now, uh, because Theresa May hadn't managed to get uh, her reform agenda through, uh, there were headlines like this appearing in the Telegraph. Theresa May risks making House of Lords a laughing stock over peerages. Uh, and uh, the BBC asking why is Theresa May dropping House of Lords reforms? So my point here is, Patrick, that uh, this is a government agenda uh, that's been going on for 20 years now. Mm. Uh, it's a mainstream media agenda because they have absolutely been behind this from the beginning. Uh, and why? Because the House of Lords has, is defeating the government uh, regularly on some of the most outrageous legislation that they try to push through. Um, and so I'm going to say that, uh, you know, if people don't understand that there is a massive risk in throwing the baby out with the bathwater here, uh, then, you know, <laughs> we're in trouble. Not only that, but when you're obsessed with the symptoms and you're not looking at the core of the problem, uh, the 1997 House of Lords uh, reform 
movement by Tony Blair was not about reform, Mike. It's about undermining uh, this branch of government, uh, which is meant to be apolitical. Um, that is the point behind hereditary peerages, whatever you agree or disagree, but you can't compare it to the United States Senate, for instance, uh, because the U.S. Constitution is not the same as the British Constitution. These are two different uh, uh, government systems. And uh, the, the problem is, be because Tony Blair took a wrecking ball to the House of Lords, right after that, a raft of bills came, like, I don't know how many laws they passed mm. uh, from 1997. It was like one every every 12 hours, I think, continuously mm. for 10 years. Um, so from a constitutional point of view, Mike, um, I would make the argument that all of those laws passed um, should really be null and void uh, because they are unconstitutional. Um, the system of government has been altered uh, without the consent of the people, I would, I would say, broadly. Um, but so, so now to use this Brexit issue as a, as a call to get rid of the House of Lords is really you're springing your own trap uh, politically. I think it's extremely short-sighted, and I think that sort of uh, taking that tact uh, means that you're not um, looking deeply into this issue, and you're really dealing with the surface circus, which is going on above. And I, it's a bit rich for Nigel Farage, to, who, who wears a Union Jack all the time, Mike, and uh, is a, a great British patriot to be undermining the very institutions that uh, are the, you know, essential fabric of the country. I think it's extraordinary. Uh, absolutely. And of course, what are they arguing for? An elected uh, second upper chamber, uh, which is going to have the same political parties represented. Yeah. Uh, and remember, we're not talking about uh, people going into the House of Lords as representatives of their communities. We're talking about people going into the, an elected House of Lords as representatives of their political parties. And Whipped. Whipped. Whipped, not just whipped by their political parties, Mike, whipped by the, by the lobbies and the corporations whose interests they will be representing. Because what happened after Tony Blair's uh, undermining of the House of Lords paid for peerages, Mike. Mm. Corruption, um, nonstop corruption in terms of paid for peerages, pay for access, um, just made a mockery of, of, of the government, of that branch of government especially trying to politicize it in the way, in the toxic way that the House of Commons uh, might be on a party basis, um, trying to basically pollute and contaminate the House of Lords with the mm -hmm. same sort of political corruption. And so it, it, is it an improvement? Is it better than it was before 1997, Mike? No. There's your answer. Yeah. Right. Uh, just a couple of uh, short uh, articles to finish with. Uh, first of all, Capita. Uh, this is widely reported across the uh, mainstream media. Uh, Capita, massive services company, uh, similar to Carillion, uh, and it looks like in a similar financial state to Carillion, uh, as we predicted uh, at the time of the Carillion collapse. Uh, so they have announced a £515 million loss for 2017. Uh, now, the reason that they say uh, that they have made this loss, loss, Patrick, and this is the important thing, really, is that they made uh, something in the region of an £800 million write-down, accounting write-down, uh, on the basis that um, in the past, uh, from an accounting standpoint, they were allowed uh, to account for profits on contracts which had not been fulfilled. In other words... They could put on their balance sheet a profit on a, on a contract uh, that they hadn't completed yet, so they didn't actually know what the contract was, what the co what the profit actually was at the end of the day. They didn't know how much money they'd spent on the contract when the contract was completed, so they didn't know what the actual profit was. But because in the contract it said that they were probably going to make this amount of profit, they would put that on their on their books. Um, so they've made an eight hundred million pound. Uh, uh, write down because that accounting practice is no longer permitted. Who signed off on that? Arthur Anderson? Uh, well, uh, I couldn't possibly <laughs> comment. But That's anyway, unbelievable. a £500 million loss for 2017. So they're now going back to their shareholders and asking for a £700 million bung from their shareholders to keep them going. Uh, is this the same capita that operates the sea charge, Mike? The congestion uh, that, charge? That is the same capita, yes. In London. So they've been creaming money off of drivers for the last how many years? Fifteen years, with this, with the uh, the biggest the cover charge to the biggest nightclub in the world, which is called London. Yes. Uh, and I don't know, did they not? Were they, have the cameras not been working? Have they not been collecting their money? 
uh, talk about printing money out of thin air. This is what Caput has been doing at the public expense for years, Mike. And now they're they're claiming that they're uh, in the they're in the red. I don't I don't understand. Well, bite, biting off more than they can chew. I think, uh, of course, Capita also famous for collecting the TV license and uh, and there raising is. the money for the BBC. So wonderful company, absolutely wonderful, wonderful company. Yes. Yes. Anyway, and, and we're going to end uh, with, with jobs. Now, of course, the United States, uh, uh, world-renowned for its manipulation of the jobs figures, Patrick. Yes. There's, well, there's two figures that no politician ever wants to own, Mike, and that is inflation and unemployment. These are the two things that you need to fudge. You need to fudge down uh, both of those figures in order to have a good political career and legacy. Uh, absolutely. But uh, in this country, uh, the it's zero hours contracts, uh, which are the main news. Uh, and uh, well, let's see what's going on here. Uh, the uh, Office for National Statistics, sorry, saying that the new business survey data for November 2017 shows 1.8 million pounds, sorry, 1.8 million contracts not guaranteeing minimum hours where work is done. Uh, and that's 6% of all contracts. Uh, and uh, it shows that 901,000 people are on zero hours contracts. Uh, between October and December 2017, that's 2.8% of all uh, people in employment. But what's interesting, although th that 901,000 people on zero hours contracts, uh, that figure they're going to maintain uh, monitoring, but they intend to discon discontinue the, build, uh, the business survey estimates on the number of contracts not guaranteeing minimum hours, which is the bigger figure. Um, of course, this helps the government uh, uh, pretend that we've got a fantastic jobs market in the UK despite the collapsing incomes, the collapsing productivity uh, and the collapsing standard of the jobs. And, and Pat, I still cannot get to grips uh, with the fact that uh, the mainstream media continues to accept the jobs news from the, Britain, from the British government without questioning the types of jobs that are being created. Uh, and the fact that uh, the standard, uh, the, the productivity and the quality of the jobs is collapsing around our ears. It doesn't matter, apparently, uh, that we don't have any high quality uh, engineering jobs anymore. It's you know, shelf stacking and coffee serving. Uh, as long as you've got a job, that's all that's important. Did you see that last week? They said a growth going to, through, into a growth phase right now, Mike. Did you see that? It was all over the, the headlines last week after the bombing of Syria. That was the sort of feel-good news. Uh, well, well, let me show you just to close uh, a growth. There is the growth in zero hours contracts oh. uh, since 2011. Well, that's something to celebrate, some growth going on there. Absolutely. So anybody wants to know why the uh, unemployment statistics are so low, uh, because these people are, you know, it's uh, they're they're more or less unemployed if they're if they're on a zero hours. Some some of them are getting some decent work out of zero hours contracts. Quite a lot of people aren't and are requiring multiple jobs in order to make a living because they're not getting any any kind of guaranteed living. Uh, so the growth in zero hours contracts uh, is pretty impressive. Well, we know that some people from the government do watch this show from time to time, so we'll give them a little advice. Um, the next thing you should do is one hour contracts. At least start with. And go from zero to one, one guaranteed hour. If the government, Theresa May, can roll this out, I think it would have a really good uh, public would really like it. One yes. hour, one hour contracts. So okay, little, go for that. Yeah. Okay, we'll have to end it there. Thank you very much for joining me, Patrick. Uh, thank you for joining us. We will be back at the same time, one p.m. as usual, tomorrow. See you then. Bye bye.